Father, as we come before you this morning, Lord, I know that there are many things in our week that clamor for our attention, many things uh, that are advertised to us that make promises of what they can do for us or how they'll satisfy us, God. But there's one and only one thing that we need, and one, one that we need here with us today, and that's you. So, Father, I pray that you'd fill this place with your presence this morning. I pray that you'd speak because we need to hear from you more than we need any other thing. And so, Father, do that today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke 1, 39 through 59 says, In those days Mary arose and went with haste to the hill country to a town in Judea. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting come to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped the servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her for three months and returned to her home. Now it, the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zechariah after his father. Let me take a moment first and dismiss our kids up through grade five. Through grade five. Uh, if those kids would like to slip out now, there's a time set aside for them specifically. We invite you, if you would, if you haven't already, when Alex read that to you, uh, if you would open your Bible, Luke chapter 1. Uh, Luke chapter 1. Uh, if you don't own a Bible, there are some sitting around you. We'd love for you to take that home uh, with you. So go ahead and take one of those. Uh, if you're using one of those Bibles and you're trying to find your way to the right spot, if you find your way to page 856, uh, you're going to be in exactly the right spot this morning. Luke chapter 1. We're going to be in verses 39, but primarily we're going to be in that section that many of you know as Mary's Magnificat. And so uh, this morning, as we continue to talk about joy, uh, nothing makes me think of joy more than New Jersey. Uh, I mean, right? That's, that's how we all are. When we think of joy, we think of Jersey. Uh, so if you were driving down Main Street in West Orange, New Jersey, you would pass a brick factory building that looks so much like a thousand other old brick factory buildings. Nothing particularly special about this building. And if you didn't see the signs, you wouldn't know that there had been anything special about this building, aside from the fact that it was the factory of Thomas Edison. And so from this building uh, and the things that happened inside this building, this insignificant building, uh, the world was lighted. It was filled with sound. It was filled with pictures through the things that were going on inside this nondescript brick factory building. Many of us, we live in unremarkable homes. We live and work in unremarkable offices. Maybe you're attending an unremarkable school like thousands of others. Maybe, in fact, you would say to anybody from the outside looking in would say that your life is pretty average. It's pretty insignificant to anyone looking in. It might be like a thousand other lives. And I know none of us want to think of our lives that way. And please don't understand 
uh, please do understand that that is not what I'm saying at all, that your life is unremarkable. In fact, I'm saying something far from it. I want you to know if you're someone who feels insignificant or small or anonymous or who fears being these things, that this book that we open in front of us has five really significant things to say about you. It says, first of all, this book says that you were created as an image bearer of the glory of God, that God created you to be his image bearer. It says that you are an object of the love of God. It says that God, because of that love, was moved to sacrifice his only son so that he might rescue you and me from our sin. It says that Jesus is not only alive, but he's coming back again so that the joy that we're talking about not, might not continue to be temporary and intermittent, but that it might be full and it might be eternal, that he's coming again for that purpose. It says that God has gifted and called you so that he might, and I, and I want you to wrap your, your mind around this for a second, that the God who created the universe, he has gifted and called you so that he might glorify himself in you. These things are significant, but I want you to understand when we talk about this, when we talk about joy, these things take an average life and they elevate that life to something of great significance, to something of eternal importance. I want you to know that you are significant because of what God says about you. You are significant because of how God feels about you. You are significant because of how God has acted towards you. These things are the foundation of your significance. Now, I know right now I sound like a bad copy of Tony Robbins, but this is really important what we're going to talk about this morning is really important because if we would truly embrace this, it would change the way that we'd see our life. It would change the way that we see our work. It would change the way that we see our time at school. It's going to change everything about how we live our day-to-day -day life, every relationship, every interaction. If we can just understand this, we're talking about joy, and, and, and can we be honest enough to say that there's not a lot of people that are just filled with joy? You may know one or two, but I, I think we could all say that those people tend to be the exception. You may know one or two places that you would say, this is a place of joy, but probably we would say, this is an exception. There aren't many of them. But as we continue in this series that I've called Finding Joy this morning, I want us to be able to uh, draw back to this promise that Jesus gives us. That's the foundation for everything that we're talking about. Jesus says to us in John chapter 15, verse 11, this is now the third week in a row that I've read it to you. It's also written on the blackboard out front, so you see it every time you leave. John 15, 11, it says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. So when we talk about finding joy, we need to understand that this is what Jesus promised for us. So if our life isn't there and the world that we inhabit and our, our office and our home and all of those things aren't quite there yet, we need to understand that this is what Christ is seeking to do in and through you. Now, I want you to notice, before we move on to our main text, you wouldn't be able to tell this, but all of the second person pronouns, all of the yous in that verse, they're all plural. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's not talking to one individual. What he's saying, and this is a message that runs all throughout the Bible from Old Testament to New Testament, is that God does these things through his people together. He does this one person rubbing off on another person. He, he intends for us to be on this faith journey together to impact others around us. You see, we're not to only seek joy for our own lives, but to seek to produce it in the lives of other people around us as well. 
to make our lives, to make our homes, to make our workplaces, to make wherever we are, whatever space we inhabit, to make that place a joy factory, that I'm producing joy in others because of the joy that God, through his word and his spirit, is producing in me. And I want us to see this this morning. I want us to learn again from Mary. We've been walking through Luke chapter 1 over the last few weeks. And so this morning, I had Alexandra read to you verses 39 through 56. And I want us to be able to focus down in on some of these verses this morning. Because once again, God uses this insignificant teenage girl. I don't mean Alexandra. I mean Mary, okay? She's not insignificant. I mean, Mary, God uses this insignificant teenage girl that God says, no, I'm going to use her to accomplish the greatest thing that I will ever do. I'm going to use her. And part of what we see this morning is that she's going to teach us about how to build joy in others. These verses sometimes called the Magnificat because of the Latin translation of the first thing that she says. When you look at Luke chapter 1, verse 46, you see there that she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. That's where we get Magnificat from, is that Latin word for magnifies. This is where she begins. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord. What we have here is Mary's song of worship. She's arrived. She's there. Uh, Remember, Gabriel said to her, I'm going to give you a sign, even though you didn't ask for it at all. You're going to go and find out that your your cousin, Elizabeth, the one whose husband said that is beaten down with years, that she's pregnant. She's six months on. And you're going to get a sign. And in fact, we saw part of that sign was she said, the baby leaped in my womb when you came. Because John, even in the womb, senses the presence of his Savior, the one that he's going to make the path straight for. And so Mary, she enters into this song of worship. And she doesn't sing it like some of us might have been guilty of this morning. Not you, I know. But but some of us might have been guilty of this morning where where there's not a lot of joy. This is a joy-filled song that Mary sings. She's arrived, she's encountering her cousin who had given up. She hears this testimony from a baby in the womb. And now she can't help but rejoice. In fact, that's what she says in verse 47. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Uh, We're coming up on the end of the year, and every end of the year, whether I spend it here in a lock-in with teenagers or I spend it at home with my wife and kids, there's always declarations of how we're going to stay up all the way through, right? The only times I've actually stayed up till midnight since uh, 1999, this is not an exaggeration, I slept through the new millennium, okay? Uh, I fell asleep somewhere around 9.30 that night, for those of you that, that can remember back, with all the, all the hype and all the talk about the change over to 2000. The only time that I ever actually do that, if you have teenagers, is the times that I'm responsible for them here. I don't want you to think I'm off in my office sleeping. But here's the thing. We make all these declarations of what we're going to do. And all the Cheetos and all the Doritos and everything else, you've got all this energy up front, but that fuel doesn't keep you going for very long. And so even with the teenagers, oh, I'm going to stay up all night long, somewhere around 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, even if they're awake, they are hating life and each other at that point, right? Because the fuel is gone. It's, It's all burnt up. And so this morning, what I want us to be able to do, I want us to embrace this fact That Christmas, while it's a time of joy, we've got to find the fuel to keep that joy going. It's it's easy to enter into a time of joy when we're reminded of it once a year. When we have the people that we love around us or we have uh, time off from work or those things. But to keep the fuel coming, that keeps you going. When Edison set out, 
with all of his inventions, one of the things he knew is if he was going to have a factory, he's got to have fuel to keep that factory running. So one of the first things that he built was the very first electrical power station. So it would be there to fuel those things continuing to come. And that's what we want to have in our lives as we seek to do this. So here's the main thing that I want you to get this morning. I want you to understand that if our life is going to be a joy factory, that it's going to be powered by worship. If our life is going to be a joy factory, then it's going to be powered by worship. Mary gets it in this order. Okay, look at verses 46 and 47 again, because I want you to see it. If, if we're going to have this in our life, verse 46 and 47, we see this order. We see worship, then joy. Worship, then joy. Because you see, worship is transformative. Worship changes things. So many people, they think that we shouldn't enter into worship if we don't feel it. We stay home on Sunday mornings because we say, well, I've had a bad week and I, I just don't feel it. I don't feel worshipful. Or you don't sing in the morning because you say, I don't feel it. My emotions are not there. But what I want you to understand is that's a misunderstanding of what worship is. I enter into worship not because my emotions are driving me to worship. I enter into worship because my spirit is coming alive as I meditate on the things of God and what he's done in me. It's not some internal emotional response. Instead, what it is, is it's a spiritual response that reflects God rather than an emotional response that reflects me. Worship is encountering God it's encountering God through his word. It's encountering God through his spirit. I pray every Sunday morning, I, I get here early and I pray that God's spirit would be at work in his place, that he would, he would take his word and he would communicate it to your heart. That, that my job is not to stand up here and entertain you. My job is to say, here's the word of God and to trust the spirit to communicate that to your heart. That's, that's what worship is is God using his word and his spirit. And it's something like Moses on Sinai. Moses treks up to Sinai and he, he, he sees God as he passes by. Elijah on the very same mountain, God passes by and he's changed. The disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration, Isaiah in being transported to the throne room of God, all of these people, they're changed and they're empowered every single time. They're changed and empowered. And when we worship, when we enter into worship, we are doing exactly that thing. And so if you and I, if we want to be part of Jesus' plan of bringing others into that full joy that he promises, then we need to make sure that we are full of that joy and that we are seeking to make the places that we are factories of joy. I want my home. I want this church. I, I, I want wherever I go, I want this place. I want joy to, to come out of me. I want the joy of the Lord to be there. I want people to see that in how I, in how I act and how I speak and what I do. So how, how do we do that? It's a nice idea, right? But how do we do that? Look at verse 48. Look at verse 48. She says, For he, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. Where does she begin? This young teenage girl, where does she begin? She says, God looks down and God sees my humbleness. This word, I mean, you know what it means to be humble, but what she's saying is she's saying, I'm low. I'm low. I'm little. I'm small in relation to who God is. I'm nobody. God didn't reach out to me because I was someone special. He certainly didn't reach out to me because my own birth was something special, as some people are raised to believe these days. It's none of those things. She says, I'm humble. I'm lowly. And she calls herself again the same thing that we saw last week in her response. She says again, she says, I'm his servant. I'm his doule. I, I, I'm just a servant. I'm a lesser submitted to a greater. Look at verses 50 through 54. She goes on to say, and his mercy is for those who fear him 
For he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of his heart. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. There's two things that are going on here that she's setting in front of us. Two things that she's doing in these verses. Number one, she's glorifying God. She's magnifying who God is. When she says that in this verse at the very beginning, she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. She's bringing glory to God. That's the first thing. And the second thing that she's doing, and these two things, they go together. She's humbling herself. And for our instruction, us as well. Because no matter how significant we might think we are, we are like Mary. We are, even if the world looks at your life and says you're significant, in comparison to God, you're not. You're not the center of the universe. We're not the center of the world. We're not the center of history. We are insignificant in ourselves, but God is glorious. One of the reasons why, and I've said this to you before in this series, one of the reasons why so many of us struggle to stay in a place of joy is because we struggle to see God as big and ourselves as small. And if you struggle on one or the other, you're going to do the other thing. If you struggle to see yourself as small and insignificant, then you will, by extension, minimize the greatness of God. And if you struggle to keep a big picture of God, to keep in your mind God, the God of the Bible, then you will, by just the result of doing that, you'll begin to inflate your sense of who you are in relation to that. Because those two things are constantly working against one another. She does both of these things. And so if we want our space, if we want our homes, our offices, our schools to be joy factories, we have to do these two things. We've got to do these two things, and they come together. We've got to cultivate humility in one another. That's the first. We've got to cultivate humility in one another. Remember, we're working together. And then secondly, coming along with it, we've got to stimulate praise of God. These two things are interwoven. There's a million different places you can do this, but I remember uh, perhaps more than any other thing. I Certain things... Certain things uh, make me queasy, I'm not going to lie. Certain things do. I don't want you to get the sense that I'm some weakling that can't handle anything. But there are certain things that bother me, and one of them is height. Uh, that's why God didn't give me any, uh, because he knew, right? But I remember going to the city of Toronto, going up, if you've ever been to Toronto, going up the CN Tower... And there's a place in the CN Tower where uh, the glass is out in front of you and you can lean across and look down below. And all the people that I was with, they were doing that very thing. And me, no, no thank you. No thank you. I, I know how small I am. I don't need to imagine my little small self falling all that way. And maybe for you, it's been the Empire State Building or flying in an airplane or any number of other things that just reinforce to you the fact that in relation to the world around you, you're small, you're insignificant. And yet, the God that we serve is so much bigger than all of these things. Pride, seeing ourselves as big, it's a joy stealer because it tells us when we encounter struggles, which we're all going to encounter, it tells us that it's ultimately up to us to fix it. And so our world is unsettled. So how do we cultivate humility in ourselves? How do we cultivate humility in others around us, whatever that place is? I would say first this. I would say that we would demonstrate humility in our serving. If you want to, if you want to cultivate humility in other people around you, serve them. Even if, and maybe especially if, your position is higher than them. Serve them. If you want to produce humility in someone else, demonstrate that service to them. The second thing I would say is uh, that you might, might cultivate humility in others by being open and often repenting to them. One thing that we've done with our kids from as long as they could understand was uh, when, when dad sinned, dad repented to his kids. 
I've always wanted to, to say before my children, I'm a sinner the same as everyone else. I want to demonstrate that kind of humility before my kids. I want to demonstrate that kind of humility before others. That when you confront me with sin, I, I want my first response to be, yes, that sin, and I need to turn away from that thing. I want you to see it demonstrated. I want you to go into your workplaces and do the same. Serve those people. Repent regularly before those people. And then thirdly, if we want to build humility in our places, then we need to use and define gospel language. Josh has been pushing me to read one of his books called Gospel Fluency. But we need to use these words as we interact with people. There are certain words that carry gospel senses. So my, my encouragement to you, if you want to produce humility and create gospel opportunities wherever you are, use words like holiness. Use words like sin. Use words like mercy and grace and forgiveness. Because these words tie themselves, anchor themselves to the gospel. They create gospel imagery in the minds of the people that we're talking to. And I've said to you before, the foundation, the first work of the gospel in all of our lives has to be humility. Because the only way you come to the cross is on your knees. The only way we come to salvation is by bowing before him. So we want, to, we want to work to see there be humility cultivated in us and through us in these places. The second thing that we've already laid out in front of you and they, they, they're woven together is that we would stimulate praise of God. We would stimulate praise of God. And listen, it, it might seem counterintuitive, but Christmas is actually a dangerous time for joy. Because it's a time when so much around us encourages us to stake our joy on family, to stake our joy on the latest consumer product, to think that we're somehow going to produce that in our lives in these things. And ultimately, they are going to let us down. And when that breaks down, you get something like this uh, billboard that I pass every time I go home these days. There's a billboard by the Cumberland Farms near my house. Some of you have probably seen it as well. It says, didn't get what you want? Divorce, $499. What a terrible, ugly picture. What a terrible, ugly picture that is. A joy-robbing message that somehow... You didn't get what you want, so go try to find someone else, perhaps, that can fill your joy. Verse 46, I said it before, it says in verse 46, my soul magnifies. To magnify is to make great. Not that we're making God something that he's not, but that we're making much of what he is. That we're seeking to reveal his greatness for everyone to see. And I want you to notice how she goes about that. Look at verse 49, just verse 49, because everything else that comes from it is really just building on these same three points. Verse 49, again, it says, For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. What is she saying? She is making much first. She's magnifying God's power. He has done great things for me. She's magnifying God's love. She then magnifies God's holiness. She says, and holy is his name. So these three things she's doing, she's making much of God's power, she's making much of God's love and mercy, and she's making much of God's holiness. This is what she's magnifying. And so how can you and I, how can we foster the praise of God in our space? And this is, this is not a complete list. It's not even close to a complete list. But I would just suggest these three things. I would suggest, number one, if, if we want to magnify the name of God, then pray. Pray and then pray again and then pray in faith and then pray together. Pray out loud. Pray asking God to do God-sized things because you really do believe that God can do it. Pray submitted to the will of God. God, not what I want, but what you want. Pray God's word back to him. 
Incorporate that into your life. Pray emphasizing God's power and his love and his holiness. Incorporate these things into your prayers. Not, that you, not only that you're praying alone, but that you're praying aloud with your family, with coworkers who come to you with their problems. I know you gotta be careful in work these days. But when people bring those problems to you, and I'm betting that for many of you, that's exactly what they do because they see something in you that they're drawn to in their time of need. You just say, can I, can I just pray with you? Not many people are going to reject that. Not many people, even in this day and age, are going to reject that. So pray. The second thing that I would say is praise. Give voice to what God has done in your life. Don't be shy about telling your testimony because you weren't once a drug dealer in a gang in Manhattan or someplace, all right? Because it's not about you, it's about what God has done in you. And so I can stand here and say, I grew up a pastor's kid. Anybody looking in would have said, that's a good person. But I know what the reality was of my heart. I know what God saved me from. So praise, give voice to what God's done in your life. Praise him for the good gifts when they come in. Praise him for his past faithfulness when you're walking through trials. Praise him for his power and his love and his holiness. Do that in front of your kids. Do that in front of your coworkers. Do that around the people that you're with. Here's what's going on in my life, but God's always been faithful. He's always provided I know that he's going to do it again because this is what I know about my God. And then thirdly, disciple. Disciple those around you. Seek to fulfill the great commission in your space. Remember, the great commission is that you would go and you would teach them to observe all that I have commanded you, right? So I want to go and I want to speak discipling words. I want to speak God's word. Read scripture, Read it out loud. Read it with them. Invite them to join in. Teach them of God by teaching them of God's word. And every time we teach God's word, it is going to call us to repentance every single time. Just trust God's word. Some of you, you, you go in your workplace. I remember Christopher and Kevin, and I love these brothers for many reasons, but this is one of them going into their workplaces and saying, uh, we're just going to start a Bible study here. And maybe there's two or three at the beginning and then others come in and they're able to interact with these guys just in reading God's word. Trust God's word. It's like Charles Spurgeon once said. He's like, he said, you don't need to defend the Bible. He said, you don't defend a lion. You just let it out of its cage. <laughs> just trust that it's going to accomplish what God desires for it to accomplish. And then the third thing that we have to do, if we, if, if we, once we cultivate humility and once we, um, brain, iPad, stimulate praise of God, thirdly, that we would magnify the grace of the gospel, that we would magnify the grace of the gospel. I had an uncle uh, who was very into astronomy. You want to see something funny? Uh, get a redneck with a big, long beard and overalls and give him a $2,000 uh, telescope. That's a strange thing, right? But there he was, and we would go out, and he would take this, and he would punch in coordinates, and he would point it at some planet, or he'd point it at the moon, or he'd point it at something else, and then he'd call us kids to come over and to look. And we'd look through this eyepiece, and we'd see in detail that we'd never seen before. He wasn't creating something that wasn't there. He was just highlighting what was so that we could see it more fully. Magnification reveals what is so that you and other people can see it. It's looking intently to understand and to experience. How does she do this? Verses 46 through 50, we've already read these verses, so I'm not going to read them again, but here's what she says. She calls God her Savior. What she's saying is, He's saved me. Mary, whatever your background is, Mary is confessing that she needs a savior and that God has done that thing in her life. God, my savior, he has saved me. And then she says, all generations will call me blessed. What she's saying is this, he'll save you too. 
He has saved me. He'll save you too. And then she says in verse 50, which you can see all three of these things woven together just in verse 50. His mercy is for all those who fear him from generation to generation. What she's saying is the grace of God in Jesus Christ is available for anyone who will admit that they need it. How do we magnify the grace of the gospel? How do we magnify that in our own lives? Well, we meditate on it every day. Every day that we might ponder the things of God. Somebody has said that the gospel is shallow enough that a child can wade in it, but it's deep enough that you can spend your whole life trying to explore the depths of it and never reach the bottom. We meditate on it daily. We remind ourselves of what we were apart from the gospel and what it says about what we are now. Secondly, we would tell our testimonies of grace, what God has done in our life, that we would speak it often to others. And then thirdly, that we would demonstrate that same grace shown to us, to those around us who need it. When we're wronged, we don't hold a grudge. When they offend us, that we're quick to forgive as we've been forgiven. That God would use that. My hope in all of this is that God would set us apart from this false joy that surrounds this holiday. And that he would fill us up with true gospel joy. That he would make us people of joy who transform the spaces that we're in into places of gospel joy. So my question for you this morning is, how do you need to cultivate that humility in your life for that to happen? How does God want to use you to do that in other people's lives as well? Are you actively seeking when you get up tomorrow morning and you think about your workday and you think about what's in front of you, does it cross your mind to say, how can I use this day not to serve my ends, not to serve my needs, but to serve someone else that God might use me to bring about humility in their day? Some of you think I'm up here without notes and uh, God is humbling me today. How can I cultivate humility in myself and others through my repenting? How can I give voice in my praying and my speaking to the glory of God? How can I do that in such a way that would encapsulate the gospel and how I speak to others around me? How can I preach the gospel to myself today and tomorrow in a way that will remind me of the joy that's mine in Christ? You see, if the foundation of our joy is God, then being a joy factory, it's powered through worship. And so my prayer for you this morning and for myself is that we would direct our hearts even now, even in these closing moments, to that power. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning that you are doing a work of joy. You're doing a work of joy through your gospel. You're doing a work of joy in our hearts. Father, I pray this morning that you would help us not to be content to seek it for ourselves, but that we might be people of joy wherever we go. So Father, we thank you for that this morning. We trust that your spirit will work in our hearts to communicate the ways that you desire to use us today, tomorrow, the next day, in every single space you send us into. So Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.